Max. Max Tronder observed the boarding procedure for what he believed would be his trip back home to Charlotte, New York. It wasn't the most pleasant way to spend an evening. A few decades prior, their father had founded a tiny pharmaceutical company that Max and his two sisters owned. The company was lucrative due to the father's development of several valuable but infrequently used medications, but there were never many opportunities for growth. Max had been in New York for the past three days, negotiating the company's sale to a major pharmaceutical company. After both of his parents had gone away, Max was leaving the contract negotiation to his lawyers and brokers because they had reached an agreement today. Max hoped he would make it home this evening, but it didn't seem likely. He was number three on the wait list for the last flight of the day to Charlotte, which was completely packed. He wasn't sure what to tell his wife Camille, so he hadn't phoned her. While sipping his second gin and tonic and contemplating the agreement and the money he and his sisters would split, he sat at a pub overlooking the gate. He received more than $10 million, and a generous transition period from Big Pharma meant that he and Camille would be living in a new way. Their twin girls were on their way, or had already left the nest. They were both juniors at Duke University, where the cost of tuition was killing him. But after the pharma transaction finalized, everything would be different. As everything was going on, the final few passengers were being pushed into the jetway by the gate agents. After then, there was a small miracle. Max noticed his name come up as having been removed off the waitlist when the boarding sign changed. He waved to the bartender, who gave him the thumbs up, dropped money on the bar, picked up his overnight bag and briefcase, and ran to the gate. He was given a boarding card by the gate agent, who also expeditiously informed him and the other two waitlisters that the seats were reserved for a group of four who had checked in remotely but had failed to show up. Max discovered he had a first-class seat when he got to the boarding door after running down the jetway with his new friends. Cleared the aircraft, sitting in first class, and arriving home a day or two early, he thought this was a good indication. That may indicate that the pharmaceutical merger will actually close. As he settled in, the boarding door shut, and the flight attendant inquired about his drink preferences while they descended to the runway. Feeling he had earned it, he took another get before drifting off to sleep, thinking of a future in which he and Camille would have enough money to travel first class everywhere they went. He was awakened by the thump and scream of landing. Eventually, he arrived at the taxi station and received a ride home. A few days ago, he had driven his pickup to the airport, but now he was tired, hungover, and it was far too late to contact Camille to come fetch him. Since they didn't reside in Charlotte, the cab ride was lengthy enough for him to nod off once more. They arrived, and the driver had to wake him up. Max gave him his money, left a big tip, and limped out of the taxi. As the cab pulled away, and he turned toward the house, he was already fantasizing about cuddling up in bed with Camille after a long, stressful day and a half. He was completely awakened and stopped by what he saw. In front of his side of the garage, in the driveway, was parked a gold Mercedes. To Max, it appeared to be an extremely elegant Mercedes. But then, all Mercedes would appear elegant to him. Max stood there for several minutes, staring at the dark interior of the house, which was already beyond midnight. About noon, he had spoken with Camille at his lawyer's office, and she had not mentioned anything about having overnight guests. He was trying not to imagine the worst, to imagine a perfect scenario in which he would be cuddling with a warm, drowsy Camille in a matter of minutes. But that wasn't how his mind was operating. So he took his time walking to the door in the breezeway that connected the home and garage. After opening it and entering the quiet home, he proceeded with even more deliberate pace through the kitchen and up the stairs to his and Camille's bedroom. Max entered the bedroom while the door stood open, clearly not expecting any guests. And he gave up, finding no other way to say it. He stopped breathing. His heart seemed to stop beating and his brain stopped functioning. He was witnessing what he had previously considered unimaginable. Spread out on her side of the bed, naked, 
and with one arm stretched over another sleeping guy who appeared to be smiling a little in his sleep, was Camille. It seemed to Max that he stood like that indefinitely. But after a while, his mind did come back to normal. It became clear why he was grinning as he slept as he glanced again at Camille, who was hugging the man. They were both snoring as well. Max was saddened by this. Until tonight, he had enjoyed listening to Camille's snore. It seemed to Max that she practically purred when she slept. Since they shared a bed, he assumed her snoring meant she was safe and sound asleep. That gentle purring sound in his ears had become his favorite sound in his sleep more than once, but not now. He vowed never again to lie down next to her and hear her snore. Despite his broken heart, Max did begin to rethink. He noticed the man's neatly arranged clothes resting on a chair that Max had occupied for countless hours. Max was starting to feel a searing wrath inside of him. After removing the car keys and wallet, he picked up the pants and took a moment to reflect. He chose to call the man Jerk, since he could beat him with a tennis racket he took out of the bedroom closet. Plus, he could defeat Camille. While both of those options may gratify Max in the short run, they could put him in serious danger down the road. Another thought was starting to take shape. As it did, he took out his cell phone to take some damning images. After snapping all the photos, Max went to get jerk shoes and clothing. He was a large guy. Max weighed about 160 pounds, or 5'10". It appeared that Jerk was at least four or five inches taller and possibly 50 pounds heavier. Even in the short run, the tennis racket might not have been the best choice. Taking the clothes and shoes in hand, Max gave his wife, the mother of his priceless daughters, one more look before hardening his heart against the love that had sustained him for almost two decades. With no tears in his eyes, he exited the bedroom and made his way back outside via the stairs. The Mercedes doors unlocked when the key fob beeped. Max climbed into the driver's seat, tucking his overnight bag and briefcase inside. Although he had never been a connoisseur of high-end vehicles, he found he enjoyed the bends after getting inside. After he sorted out the controls and engaged the gearbox, he drove off. Max stopped after driving about a mile and looked in his wallet. It contained some cash, business cards identifying him as Franklin Thompson a senior salesman at a nearby Mercedes dealership, and a driver's license with an address in Charlotte. Max figured he could get him in serious trouble, and possibly Camille if her lover had family there. However, Max was tired and went to a local motel for the night. Camille. Camille Trunder possessed great discretion, despite the realization that she was not as smart as her husband Max. She had allowed her affair with Franklin Thompson to go on for nearly five months without arousing his suspicions. The next morning, lying in bed with Franklin, she wondered if Max had stayed in New York. He might not be as great as Max in bed, but outside of it, he was still very good. She thought it was time to call it quits on this affair, feeling that he was becoming too much like a car salesman. Like the soccer players she had loved in college, she admired Franklin's size. However, Franklin was becoming too smug. She gave in to his desire to stay the night, but that was the last time she would do so. Even though Max knew nothing, she still found it insulting to have a random man in their marital bed when she intended to spend the rest of her life with him. It went off. The alarm clock. At seven in the morning, it was time for their last brief arousal sex with Camille on top before they showered and went to work. Later today, she would call Franklin and tell him that the affair was over in a firm but gentle manner. She then went to take a shower. When Franklin returned from the shower in the guest room, she was dressing in the bedroom and he had a towel around her waist. After standing for a moment, he asked, Camille, where did you move my clothes? What? What? I didn't move them anywhere. Where did you put them last night? Right there on that chair but they're gone. Did you take them into the guest room with you? They must be here somewhere. He stumbled back down the hall to the guest room, murmuring, mm, uh, uh, before turning around right away. No, 
They're not here. They're not there. They're... He stammered as he attempted to explain the disappearance of his garments. Camille, thinking of the two of them having had too much to drink the previous evening, remarked a little angrily. Did you maybe leave them downstairs when we came in last night? Franklin said. No, I'm sure I haven't seen it, but I think I'll go look for it, and left the bedroom. Quickly returning, he ran up the stairs. Camille, Camille, my car is gone. My clothes aren't downstairs. Someone was here last night. They took my clothes. They stole my car. Damn, what's going on? What, what, what? Camille asked, unable to interpret Franklin's words. How could his car and clothes disappear? They had spent the entire night inside the house together. Is there a chance that someone broke in? Suddenly, Camille threw herself onto the bed. Franklin turned to ask, What? What? Camille attempted to respond, but she was unable to breathe, let alone talk. At last, she whispered, Franklin, what if it was Max? What if he came home from New York while we were sleeping? What if he took your stuff in your car? Franklin spat out, Oh, damn, and fell onto Camille's bed. His voice trailed off as he considered a future that might be anything from just bad to completely disastrous. You need to find out where he is. It might have been him, but if he is still in New York, that means some burglar broke in. And that means we need to call the cops. I have to get my stuff back and my car. Oh, damn, that car. If we call the cops, they'll want to know who it belongs to and it's in my wife's name. Camille took out her phone and keyed in the number for Max's office, saying, I'll call his office. His secretary comes in really early, and she will know where he is. Despite it being close to eight o'clock, Max's secretary responded right away. Max Tronder's office? May I help you? Hi, Sheila. This is Camille. Oh, I know it's really early, and ooh, I'm not sure where Max is. He didn't call last night, so... Uh, have you heard from him? Camille, it is early, and I know the team in New York worked really late last night. They probably are getting a late start today. I talked to Max about six yesterday, just before I went home. He said they were making good progress, and they might have a deal today. That's great to hear. So, he is still in New York, right? Yes, I'm sure he is and I expect to hear from him as soon as they all get back to the lawyer's office. Do you want me to ask him to call you? Yes, please, but only if he has time. I know how important this deal is. They hung up, and Camille turned to face Franklin. Okay, will do. Bye. Max is still in New York, so we need to think about calling 911 to report a break, in, and a car theft. Camille. What are we going to tell them? That your lover had clothes stolen from your bedroom and your car stolen from your driveway? I mean, what the hell? We're really screwed. Okay, I get it. Let's think about this. How about if I drive you to your house and leave you there? You get clothes on and you report the thefts as if they happened there while your wife was taking the kids to school and, uh, Maybe you don't report the stolen clothes. That might be harder to explain than a stolen car. Yeah, except I told my wife I was going to Atlanta yesterday for a meeting about the new Mercedes S-Class, and I wouldn't be home until this afternoon. Okay, but the plan still works. We just wait until maybe noon when you would be getting back anyway. You stopped by home, left the keys in the car since it was a quick stop before you went to the dealership, and your car got hijacked while you were in your house. You know, I think that might work. And I could say I left my wallet in the car, and they took that too. And we can hang out here for a few hours. Maybe end up needing another shower, maybe together. Camille worked as a paralegal in a modest law office. Franklin, I need to call in sick to work. The job, though monotonous, was quite bearable. Stepping out into the hallway to make the call, she returned to the bedroom to find Franklin back in bed. She was tempted, but thinking of Max and her decision to end the affair, she decided not to give in. Franklin, she said, not even bothering to undress. I think it's time to end this. 
We've had a good run, but you know it could have been Max last night. We were lucky that it was actually a bad guy. Let's find some clothes for you, and maybe go get some breakfast at a drive through place. Franklin gave her a serious look, considered trying to talk her out of it, but in the end, decided she was right. Fortunately for them, there was always another lovely middle-aged mother entering the showroom that proved to be more difficult than expected. Okay? I agree. It has been a good run. So, what about some clothes? Max was four inches shorter and Franklin 50 pounds heavier. Finally, Camille discovered some worn-out, ragged sweatpants that, after she cut some Vs out of the material at the waist, sort of fit Franklin. Then, in order to keep the sweatpants up, she knotted some shoelaces around his waist. She also discovered a hoodie that had been laundered in the incorrect washing machine load, turning it pink. After she removed the sleeves and added more space to the armholes, Franklin was ready for his attire. She opened her mouth to say something about clown clothes, then saw his expression and smiled a little. After deciding to wait for Franklin's house, they opted to watch TV. Max. Max. Max had drove into the driveway at the location on Franklin's driver's license earlier that morning. Right around the time, Franklin realized his clothes and car were missing. There was a small bicycle leaned against the wall of the garage of a nice house. For a brief while, Max pondered and sat in the car but he did not cry. He'd had a fast-paced night in the motel and had gone for a run right before dawn. It astonished him that his condition hadn't gotten worse. Perhaps he was still in shock. He walked up to the front door and took Franklin's wallet out, pulling out the driver's license. After he rang the bell, a young woman who appeared to be in her 20s and was attractive in a stressed-out way answered the door. Max was wearing his suit from the previous day in New York, with no tie and a wrinkled white shirt. Though he didn't look good, he hoped he didn't come across as menacing. He gestured to the woman to view Franklin's driver's license and pointed to the gold Mercedes. The woman slammed the door in his face before he could say anything. But she quickly opened it again while holding up her phone. I have 911 on my phone, ready to hit send, unless you tell me my husband is okay. They stared at each other for a moment before her face fell and she opened the door to let him in. Mom, I have a picture in my phone of your husband and my wife in bed last night, naked and sound asleep. Frankly, I don't think your husband is okay and I don't think my wife is either. When they heard Mommy coming from the kitchen, she got up to say something. She turned away and headed back to the kitchen, Max assuming, saying, Wait here, I'll be right back. He heard voices, hers and the voice of one or more children. When she came back, she was offering him a cup of coffee. I hope you drink it black. I have to get my kids ready for school and then drive them. I'm afraid I trust you right now more than I trust my husband. You can stay here until I get back and then we'll talk. Okay? Max sat down in the living room and the wife and two children soon emerged. Fine, Max answered. I'm afraid you and I are in the same boat. She hurried them out the door, introducing him as her father's friend. Max did nothing except sit there, sip his bad coffee, consider phoning his office, and eventually do nothing but sit there. Without saying anything, the woman bolted from the living room and up the stairs. She returned a few minutes later, looking more put together with her hair styled and lipstick applied. She extended a hand to Max. She shook hands and gave her introduction. Max had to giggle at her way of phrasing. It felt good to laugh. Sorry about the turmoil earlier. I'm Molly Thompson, currently married to Franklin Thompson, who is currently involved with the woman to whom you are currently married. After explaining what had happened the previous evening, he said, You are absolutely right about all the currentlies. I'm Max Tronder, and my wife is currently Camille Tronder. Molly began to cry at that point. Camille and I will be getting a divorce, and I'm sure the pictures will help me get a decent settlement. I can send them to your phone if you think you might need them. Yeah, I guess I should have them, Molly said, staring at Max with lifeless eyes. She stopped him as he went to grab his phone, saying, Wait, don't send them to me. If I see them, I will never get those pictures out of my mind's eye. 
You keep them, and if I need them, I can call you. Right? Sure, Max replied, before adding, I may not be in my current job much longer, and I will definitely not be in my current home any longer. Let me give you my lawyer's name and number. You can always reach him, if you need the pics, or if you need any help in a divorce situation. Molly replied, Okay, thanks. But what do we do right now? Are you returning the car? Are you going to wait for Franklin and try to beat him up? You saw him. You could see he's a pretty big guy even though he's gotten sort of fat. He was supposed to be in Atlanta yesterday for some kind of car meeting and stay overnight there. He should be home sometime today. You know, I've never driven a Mercedes before and I kind of like the car. I'm thinking I will keep it until somebody makes me return it. Your husband. I have to tell you that he goes by jerk. May have. Molly and Max. Both started laughing, desperate for any kind of light-hearted entertainment. Molly stated, The car is actually in my name. Max liked that idea, but stayed silent since Molly was obviously still working out a plan. For some tax reason, more depreciation, I think, Franklin. Put it in my name since I drive more than he does. She continued, pausing in thought. And... She continued, you know, since I own that car, I can write out a permission slip for you to drive it, and the cops can call me to confirm if you get pulled over. And another thing, she continued, we have had a lot of break-ins in our neighborhood lately. You have Franklin's keys and clothes. If the key we keep hidden in the backyard is gone when he gets here, he may try to break in. And if our security system is turned to instant alert, he could attract some interesting help from the police. Molly, I think I am falling in love all over again. You are magnificent. Okay, okay, calm down. Franklin may just wait to return until the kids and I are back from school this afternoon, but I can pick them up and go to a park for a while. Give him more time to get into more trouble than he is going to be in when I see him. Whatever happens, please let me know especially if he does get into trouble with the police, and call me when you need the car back. I don't want you to get into any trouble. Max departed in the elegant gold Mercedes saying, Will do. Now you need to get out of here, and so do I. He wondered how much one similar, in a better color, would cost. He expected Molly would fetch the secret key, set the alarm, and go for the remainder of the day as she had given him the permission paper. Franklin and Camille. That day, at midday, Camille and Franklin did make it to Franklin's residence. Dropping him off, Camille drove off as fast as she could, as if she wanted to prevent any more contamination. Franklin approached his front door, fearing that Molly could be home, but also hoping that it might be unlocked. Naturally, it was secured, so he quickly made his way around the house to the backyard rock where they stored an extra key. However, the rock had vanished. He said, Oh, damn, as he peered at his house's back and considered breaking in. He attempted the rear door as well, but it was locked, so he felt he was stuck breaking in. He counted which of the windows around the rear was the best to break. His choice was the family room window. Breaking it would allow him the most space to enter the house because it was the largest in the back. He examined the glass and snapped off a limb from a tree he had been planning to trim. He needed a technique to get through the glass that would break from the window because he was barefoot. He retrieved a pair of chairs from the rear deck and positioned them next to the window. He reasoned that he could merely be cautious once he entered the family room and climb over the chairs to avoid the glass. He took a couple of deep breaths and was good to go. When Franklin swung the branch into the family room window, it exploded with a satisfying bang. The family's home warning system then started to howling, which was terrible for Franklin. Even worse for him, Molly had contacted the local police station that morning to report possible break-ins in their neighborhood. So it just so happened that a police cruiser was passing down his street. Franklin muttered, Damn, damn, as he hurriedly tried to climb over the chairs and get inside the house to disable the stupid security system but not fast enough. Franklin turned to face two police officers who had both drawn their weapons. Police. Police. 
Stop right there and back away from the house slowly. Put your hands in the air, Franklin yelled back. Following instructions, he climbed from the seats and backed away, barely cutting his feet. He began to say, Officers, I can explain, but was interrupted by one of the officers who handcuffed him after taking his hands behind his back. His effort at an explanation was met with disdain as the policeman read him his Miranda rights. The policeman then asked him if he had any more questions. When one of the officers questioned Franklin if he had any identification, he responded, Yes, yes. This is my house, and I, uck, don't have my key, so I was breaking in to get some clothes and call my office. The officers may have been thinking clown wear when they saw his sweatsuit attire. Ah, uh, no, no, I don't. You see, I lost my car and all my clothes and stuff and I just need to get in so I can get some real clothes. Mister, how did you lose your car? Well, I was staying last night at a friend's house and this morning the car was just vanished, you know? Have you reported the unexplained absence? Did you maybe leave it anywhere? Perhaps in a bar? Franklin was at a loss for words. He didn't want to divulge his whereabouts or the reason behind his failure to report the disappearance of the automobile but he also didn't want to go to jail for attempting to break into his own home, and the handcuffs were quite uncomfortable. Eventually, he thought of a possible solution. Kindly give my wife a call. Maybe you could give me a ride to my office so she can recognize me. One of the police officers took Molly's phone number and walked off to call her. Franklin could hear the cop's side of the call. They'll help me buy clothes there, he said. Realizing he was going to have a hard time at the car dealership, but it was a lot better than going to jail or having Molly come to the house. Officer Riles with the Charlotte Police here, ma'am. We have a man here who says he is your husband, and we are at? He provided the address. Yes, ma'am. He was attempting to break into your home because he had misplaced his clothes and... No, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Of course we will. The woman says her husband is in Atlanta, and anyone breaking into her house must be a burglar. Thank you, ma'am, he said, turning back to Franklin. She hopes we lock you up and destroy the key. However, nevertheless, as the police marched Franklin to their vehicle to be taken to the station, he was on the verge of tears. Camille, on the other hand, had driven to her workplace 30 minutes late, but she promised to make it up. She contacted Max's office after failing to get an answer on his cell phone, still concerned about him since she hadn't heard from him. Hello, Sheila. Camille once more. Since I haven't heard from Max in a while, I'm starting to worry a little bit. Have you? No, I haven't. That must mean he's still in New York with the lawyers, but he rarely calls these days. Since you seem a little concerned, I'll give him a call to see how he's doing. Either he or I will then give you a call back in a short while. All right. Camille did receive a call back after a short while, saying, thanks, Sheila. You're the best secretary in the world. This is Sheila Camille. Speaking with a law office secretary, I learned that Max departed late yesterday in an attempt to board the final aircraft to Charlotte. So, to see how Max was doing, I gave his mobile a call. After we spoke, he requested me to let you know that he will give you a call later. All right. As Camille disconnected, a serpent began to grow in the pit of her stomach. Thank you, Sheila. Ah, uh, thank you, she said. Max, Max. After hanging up with Sheila, Max drove the gold Mercedes to a new attorney, a divorce attorney Fred Thomas, his long-standing business lawyer, had recommended. Max trusted his business attorney, and he thought he could trust the new attorney as well. Tronder, may you kindly take a seat? The receptionist said, Mrs. Reinhardt will be with you in just a moment. He sat down, feeling a little more at ease in the lawyer's office, which was furnished tastefully, but not ostentatiously. Before he had time to worry anymore, a somewhat stout, fifty-something woman with clearly dyed red hair entered the reception area. Mr. Tronder? My name is Anna Reinhardt, she said.
standing and nodding to Max. I should take the finest care of you, Fred informed me over the phone. Let's talk about your situation in my office. Let me show you around. Max followed her into a nice but not fancy office, accepted some coffee from the receptionist, and proceeded to tell his story. Skipping over the Mercedes part, though he suspected Anna might find it a Mercedes part, though he suspected Anna might find it amusing. Of finding an unfaithful wife, wanting a divorce, and wanting to protect his assets, especially the pros. Do you mind if I call you that, Max? She said. And my name is Anna, to which he nodded. The good news. Well, at least somewhat good news, considering your circumstances, is that your shares are regarded as separate property because, according to Fred, you and your sisters own the business before you wed your wife. That is, neither the shares of your business nor the earnings from sales belong to your wife. However, you must maintain the shares and the proceeds of the sale apart from any joint account you may own with your spouse. Makes sense. I believe so. But what about our home, retirement funds, and other similar things? Well, that's not very good news for you. You will be paying some alimony for a few years because your salary is significantly larger than hers. If we increase the alimony, we can probably avoid making any payments from our retirement account. Although it may not seem pleasant, the temporary discomfort is usually preferable to having to distribute your retirement funds decades down the road. No child support, since your children are attending college. I take it that you accept responsibility for the remaining costs associated with their education? That's okay. I agree. What about the house? You and your spouse must choose your desires. You can choose to buy each other out at the present appraised worth or you can elect to sell it and divide the revenues. I am not interested in the house at all after what I witnessed last night. Since I doubt Camille would be able to purchase my half, I suppose I will have to sell. All right, I'll draft the documents in that manner. Since the divorce petition is a very conventional form, I can prepare it for you to review tomorrow, or earlier if you choose so that we can serve her in the afternoon. Next week, a suggested settlement deal can be reached. Wow, that moved rather quickly. Well, I, Mr. Hear me out, Max Tronder. Maybe you and your spouse have the opportunity. Maybe therapy or even a little period of time could help. Not at all. No? All I'm really dealing with is shock. Less than a day ago, I was excited to tell my wife the good news about the company's sale and eager to go home. And here I sat, discussing the possibility of getting a divorce. However, you ought to proceed. I'll work out a solution for it. Okay, but if you change your mind, just call me and we can adjust. Max said as he paid her a retainer and walked out of her office. As he did so, he wondered a little bit about the situation surrounding the jerk he had seen the previous evening, which brought to mind that he had previously told his secretary he would give Camille a call. Camille. Hello? Camille said as she answered the phone in her workroom at the legal business. It's Max. Camille. You tried to reach me by calling. Oh, Max. I'm so glad you called. I have, uh, missed you. Do you feel like... Where are you exactly? I'm here in Charlotte, Camille. Well, when were you back? That snake raised its head from deep within her stomach. Last night, Camille, I got back last night. The snake bit. It bit hard. Camille sank back into her chair, realizing she had to continue this discussion even though she was having trouble breathing, much less talking. Camille, I'm hanging up now, she said. No, Max, no. She barely managed to get out. Please. Please, could we meet somewhere? Max hesitated. I need to see you and, and just see you for a few minutes. This woman had been his love, his girl's mother, and the most significant person in his life for over 20 years. The snake bit even harder when Max said, Okay, Camille, Center Cafe at 6. Camille had to say yes, but Center Cafe was a special place for her and Max since they had met there years ago 
both of them out with friends, and now she was afraid of why Max had suggested it. Max, please pay attention, and I'll see you there. Max hung up, leaving Camille sobbing as the snake continued to bite her. I'm sorry, and I love you, she said. Although Camille had been messed up more than once in high school, she thought she was spared the need to feel helpless when Max came along. Max was everything she needed. Strong, in bed, loving, a great father to the girls, a good provider. But sometimes, when she was alone, when she was sure no one would see, she thought about one of those soccer guys. Camille got to the cafe early. Max wasn't there yet, so she ordered a glass of wine and sat there thinking about what a horrible person she was. If it hadn't been for the plane ride to Charlotte from the West Coast, where Max was visiting some pharmaceutical company trying to sell a new drug, and she'd accompanied him on the weekend to rest up before his meetings. Those sessions of solitude would have been enough. When she flew home alone on an overnight flight, she was seated next to a large man, the coach of what turned out to be a local NFL team. They talked, drank too much, and she fell asleep with her head on his shoulder and woke up to his hand under her skirt. Thinking back on that night now, she realized she should have screamed or at least pushed his hand away. But instead, Camille let this guy do whatever he wanted. The flight landed, and they went straight to the nearest motel where they had sex until they were exhausted. She loved these sensations that a big man could give her, and a guilt. She didn't remember feeling guilty, only relieved that Max didn't return until a week later when her body had recovered. That coach had only lasted one season in Charlotte, and maybe Camille would have gone back to being a faithful wife. But before he left, he'd introduced her to a lineman on the practice squad. Not a star, not even a main roster player, but just as strong and dominant in bed as the coach. Camille was even grateful when he was traded. She wanted to remain loyal to Max, but the guilt had finally made itself felt. By the time their girls left for college, Camille had come to terms with her infidelity. She treasured the time she spent with Max and was grateful for the extra time they spent together after the girls left. But as soon as Max did something kind for her, a snake crept in. He said it was time for her to get a new car and she should choose a premium car. With regret, she decided to visit the Mercedes dealership where Franklin Thompson was waiting for her. He pushed all the right buttons to get her into bed even though he didn't sell her a Mercedes. And even though Franklin wasn't the best in bed, she knew that wasn't right. Even though he was strong and large, Max's treatment of her was much better. More than that, it was wrong because it had its flaws. She felt that her marriage was intact because she had gotten away with it in past relationships. She wanted to be faithful because it was the right thing to do, not have sex with curlers, even if at the moment she and Max were more in love with each other than ever. Even if Max hadn't found them, letting Franklin spend the night in her marital bed had been a terrible mistake. However, she had yielded to him, and now she feared she would have to pay a terrible price for it. Hi, Camille. Max was standing next to her when Camille looked up. She realized she had imagined it because he looked considerably older than he had before he left for New York. The snake continued to lodge in her stomach. Hi, Max. Thank you for being here. I don't even know how to start talking about how sorry I am, he said. May I ask some questions? As he took a seat. Oh, Max, please, no. If we have any chance, questions and answers will just kill that chance. Max, we should run away just for a few days to some island in the Caribbean where we can reconnect, where we can hold each other, where we can hold each other, where? Camille knew she had to put up with the pain and let Max vent as much as he wanted, but the snake persisted in biting. Camille, please, don't be delusional. If you can't answer my questions, I'll get up and leave now, just perhaps. He could overcome his rage and reach a reconciliation of some sort. Okay, Max, ask me anything. She found the inquiry. Do you know what time I got home last night? Odd. She stopped talking. 
Oh, no, not exactly. It had to be after. She anticipated his next query, which was as follows. And do you know what I saw when I got home? When I walked upstairs to our bedroom? Or, I should say, what used to be our bedroom? Yes, Max. I know what you must have seen. And I know it had to be one of the worst things you ever saw in your whole life. And I know it is entirely my fault that you saw that. And I beg you to please hear me. Max, I am sorry. Sorry enough that I will not contest any kind of divorce you want. If you want to beat me, you can do it right here and I will not complain. If you want to. Shut up, Camille. Next question. How many men since we have been married? If you lie, if I think you lie, I get up and walk out. Truth was not the first thing on Camille's mind. It was the second, that lying was simply too dangerous, and the third, that she was probably going to have to end her marriage nonetheless. Three, Max, three men that I wish now I had never met. I think I see in your eyes that our marriage is over, and I understand that. You deserve someone better than I am. I'm willing to do just about anything to give us another chance. But I understand if you want to not have anything more to do with me. Max stood up and left, saying, Get a lawyer, Camille. You will be served with divorce papers tomorrow. At first, Camille was too shocked to cry as she sat there. She began to cry as the snake in her stomach bit her hard as she tried to digest what Max had just said. Max. Max. As he left the cafe, Max remembered the first time he and Camille had met there decades ago. He wondered if their last meeting would be their last private conversation. Hearing your wife admit to having sex with other guys is probably the worst kind of intimacy, he thought bitterly. How could he forget that she was sleeping with that Toad Franklin in their own bed, snoring like hell? In the twenty-odd years they'd spent together, he could probably handle three nameless men, maybe with more humiliation on her part in counseling, just maybe, but that scene in their bed would stay with him forever. Their union was over, and finally, he burst into tears, sitting in that damn gold Mercedes. Max noticed at one point that night was falling. He wiped his cheeks, blew his nose, and considered what Molly Thompson had said that morning, a year ago. It seemed to him now, he was instructed not to send her any images of her husband having an affair with Camille. She had a feeling that facing the visual proof would make forgiveness much more difficult. Max made the decision to give her a call to let her know about that idea and to find out how the Mercedes was doing. Hello, Molly said as she picked up her house phone. Molly, this is Max Tronder from this morning. I'm just calling to see how you are and to check on what I should do with the car. Max, thanks for calling. I'm hanging in there, I guess. You can keep the car for now. Franklin is in so much trouble he won't need it for a while. Trouble? I hope you didn't shoot him. No, but he might be wishing that I did. He got arrested for trying to break into our house and apparently took a swing at one of the cops. You know he's a big guy and the cop tasered him. Then something happened while he was in jail. He won't talk about it, but I think he may have been assaulted in some way by another inmate. I wouldn't talk to him, and he finally had to call his brother to bail him out. And that means his whole family knows what's going on. Wow. Molly, I can't say I'm sorry for him, but I'm sorry for you. I do want to tell you that you made the absolutely right decision this morning, not to look at the pictures of him and my wife. If you have any possibility of reconciling, those pictures would make it a whole lot harder. Yeah, he finally got home a couple of hours ago, crying and telling me how sorry he was and begging me to let him stay. At least for now. You know we have two little kids, so I'm going to try to work this out. But life is not going to be easy for him. His own brother, who's a lawyer, told me I should insist on a post-nup agreement, and he said he would help with it. Plus, I'm going to be controlling our finances, at least for a while. Franklin is going to be on a pretty short leash, and I plan to jerk his collar a lot. Max sat there, 
kind of envious of Molly as they hung up. Way to go, girl. I wish you all the best. And when you need the car back, just give me a call. Perhaps Franklin had picked up a lesson. Aside from what had occurred to him in jail, being arrested and charged with assault for attempting to punch a policeman might have scared him half to death. For the sake of Molly and their children, Max hoped so. When he was finally back in his motel room, he drove. Before attempting to go asleep, he needed to make a phone call to his daughters, Jane and Joan. Jane said, Hi, Daddy, he thought. Though they were fraternal twins, they might have easily passed for identical. They shared a similar voice, attended the same opulent institution, and majored in the same field, nursing. If nothing else, at least their appearances didn't exactly match. They were clearly sisters, but not really twins. Max frequently admitted, albeit only to himself, that he was glad they weren't exactly same. He also confessed, again, only to himself, that he loved to spoil them. They were very good at ganging up on him, and he thought it would be even worse if two identical young women were working him to get a car, permission to stay out late, money to go to Florida for spring break, or whatever the daddy please request of the day was. Janie? I replied, he said. Yes, your estimate was correct. You had a 50-50 chance, of course. What's going on? Hey, it's Saturday tomorrow, and I would want to take you and your sister out to breakfast. How about we call it brunch and go there at 11 o'clock? At that 4th Street restaurant where we used to hang out? I'm okay with that, um. Hold on a second, she said, returning after he heard some noises. And it's okay with Joan, too. Could we? Could we? Let's make it just the three of us for tomorrow, okay? Because their last brunch had included six or seven of their pals, he swiftly interrupted her. Jane said, Yes, but tell me what's. He cut me off again, not wanting to begin a phone conversation that would be difficult enough in person. Hey, I have to go. I'll see you at 11. Love you and send my regards to your sister. He hung up, hoping she wouldn't call Camille, but he couldn't tell her that since she would have phoned right away. Eleven tomorrow morning would come around far too quickly. Camille, after Max left the cafe, leaving her with his advice, or warning, or curse, or whatever it was, to find a lawyer, Camille had a hard time stopping the tears. She knew she'd messed up, ruined everything. Her marriage, her family, her whole life. She knew her daughters would find out. Her parents would. All her friends. She would probably lose Max's in her house, and Max, poor, poor Max, seeing her lying in their bed, naked, probably with that damn Franklin on top of her. That scene must have just about killed Max, and Camille's tears continued. A waitress finally came over and asked if she needed to move to the ladies' room. Camille snuffled up her crying and managed a no thank you. She paid the bill and left, heading to the soon not to be. Her home anymore. When she got there, she found some gin in the totally wrong amount. Not enough to make her pass out, but too much to help her figure out how to get Max back. After she drank it all, it did help her fall asleep, hoping for some kind of miracle to bring back her Max. Max and his kiddos. Max had driven the two hours from Charlotte, reviewing and approving the draft divorce petition early that morning, and used the time to figure out how and what to tell Jane and Joanne. But first, the routine. Hugs and kisses. How is school? How is work? Food ordered and eaten. Plates cleared. And then, finally, the real conversation. Max was sitting in the bistro at 11 the following morning when his daughters walked in. Daddy, you look kind of sick, and we know something is wrong, Joan said. Are you here, for example, to announce that you have cancer? And if so, what happened to mom? Girls, yes, I do have bad news, but it's nothing physical. No one is going to die, and it's mom, Jane said abruptly. She did something really bad. Is she abducting one of the attorneys in her company, for crying out loud? A youthful, muscular physique 
that Joni or I ought to pursue? The two girls burst out laughing, taken aback by the ridiculous notion until they noticed their father was not amused. Daddy, no, no, not mom, not... Joan was afraid to say what was on her mind. Ladies, pay close attention to what I have to say. Your mother has cheated, yes. She may not have cheated on you guys, but she has cheated on me. The girls rose up and tried to give their dad and each other simultaneous hugs. But Max started sobbing too. Yes, it does, Daddy, Joan answered, her eyes welling up with tears. If her cheating is breaking up our family, then yes, she is cheating just as much on us as she is on you. People were gazing a little, so Max quickly paid the bill, and they proceeded to the park, a girl on each side of him, all of them hanging on to each other. Dad, let's get out of here, Jane remarked. There's a park about two blocks away, and we'll have more privacy there. Once they had located a bench to share, Jane said, Tell us, Daddy, we deserve to hear how bad this is. She's right, you know, Joan responded. We're pretty grown up and we can handle it. Max began. I agree that you are both grown up and that your mother did cheat on all of us. But as I was driving over here, I debated what I would tell you. I regret to inform you that I discovered your mother in our home bed with another man. And she subsequently admitted that there had been other men before him. More tears from them all. And then... Finally, silence as they all considered the news and their futures, followed by, I think I'm still in some shock, but I know your mom and I cannot come back from this. I have already talked to a divorce lawyer, and your mom is going to be served with a divorce petition later today. Girls, as bad as this is, you need to put yourselves and your schoolwork first. There is plenty of money to cover your senior year here at Duke. And if either or both of you want to do graduate work, I suspect I can find some money to cover that also. But there's a quid pro quo here. They both looked at him. What did he mean? I am happy to pay for your education, but I expect hard work and good grades from you. Yes, what your mom has done makes concentrating on school harder. But you told me you are grown-ups and real grown-ups. And real grown-ups, mature, disciplined people, can handle adversity like this, right? They both looked at each other and began to cry while hugging once more. Jane was looking serious, but Joan was giving him the confidence he needed to hear. Yes, yes, Daddy, you're the best, and we will absolutely, positively not let you down. Daddy, Joan's right, we will not let you down. But what about you? Are you going to be okay? What are you going to do? As for me, what your mom has done has pretty much beaten me up. I could crawl in a hole and just, you know, suffer. Feel sorry for myself. Try to figure out a way to reconcile with your mom. But I realized that is not taking care of me. First of all, I want both of you to know that what you have said doesn't surprise me one bit. I know you will continue to do well in school and I will continue to be proud of you. I have been caring for other people my entire adult life. When I first started working at your grandparents' business, I was looking after them. After they passed away, I looked after my sisters because they had ownership stakes in the business. And after that, I looked after your mom and all of you. Though it may sound like I'm whining, I'm not. I am free to stop worrying about my sisters because the company is going to be sold soon. Camille is no longer with us. And to you all, I swear that I will be delighted to look after you and assist you in beginning your adult life. That's what then? In my life, ladies have been two out of three home runs. Not at all awful. That leaves me. And you know what? I am looking at this whole cheating and divorce thing not as the worst thing in my life, but as a chance for a new life. A whole new life devoted to taking care of one person. Me. Okay? Dad, really? I mean, if you really mean what you're saying, that's great, replied Joan. Jane was a bit more dubious. Dad, 
What does all that really mean? A new life? What? Working for another pharma company? Buying a farm? What? Good question. And I actually have a good answer. No specifics yet. But this new life is going to be physical. I'm going to run marathons, climb mountains, sail across the Atlantic, hike the Alps, go on safaris. There are a million things for me to do. And you know what? While I'm doing these things, I might meet a pretty woman doing the same things. And who knows? With their jaws hanging open, both girls gazed at him and said, Damn, Dad, that's... that's amazing. This was no adventurous stud. This was their father. Did you really come up with all this driving over from Charlotte? Jane responded. After giving his girls one last hug and kiss and shedding a few more tears, Max said, Well, yes. Partly, but also, I haven't slept much. And my mind has been spinning around, coming up with different ideas. I mean, I could start drinking and feeling sorry for myself. But instead, I'm going to make the best of this mess. Trust me, I'm going to be okay. Max then left to return to Charlotte by car. Still driving the gold Mercedes, Camille and the daughters. The girls called their mother as soon as Max walked out the door. Hello? The Trondor's home phone was answered by a rough voice. Joan pressed the speaker on her cell. Mom, it's Joan and Jane. We just had brunch with Daddy, and he told us some awful news. What? Ah, uh, what did he tell you? Well, divorce was the big word, and your cheating was the cause. Dad gave us a little more detail. But that's basically it. Is it true? Oh, girls, it's complicated. You father and I have been married a long time. And this... <coughs> yes, I've made a big mistake. Well, more than one, actually. But I'm sure we can get past this. I just need to give your dad some time to... Mom! Joan shouted. Listen, Dad said. Divorce. He wasn't talking about fixing a mistake. Mom, he was talking about cheating. Well, yes, technically, he's right. But that doesn't mean we can't fix this. I told him I would do anything. It was Jane's turn to cut in, Mom. I think you are being delusional. He told us he has already seen a divorce lawyer. He really sounds like there is no way back for the two of you. Joan and I don't want to take sides. But you need to be realistic. The person on the other end of the call was tortured. Jane and Joan exchanged glances. Was a car ride to Charlotte necessary? At last, Camille said in a whisper, I know, I know, I know I have screwed up, ruined my marriage. I think your dad hates me, and he's right. I have done hateful things. Your dad told me to get a lawyer, and he's right about that too. I'm sorry, girls. I know this is awful for you too, Joan said. Mom, don't worry about us. We'll be okay. And I know Dad is doing the best he can. You need to take care of yourself. Getting a lawyer sounds like a good idea. Jane and I can drive over to Charlotte if you need us to. They hung up, the girls still unsure of what to do. Thank you, girls. That's sweet. I'll be okay. I just need some time to adjust to what I have done. They spoke some more, finally choosing not to go home but to let their rents deal with each other without daughters chiming in. You know, Joan observed, it's funny in a not funny way. We're more worried about mom who caused this whole mess than we are about daddy, a little hungover from the previous night's gin and more than a little depressed after speaking with her daughters. Camille sat in the Charlotte home. She was aware that she needed to get up, get dressed, and leave the house. She thought, do something. As her thoughts turned to perhaps getting some more gin, the doorbell rang. When Camille answered the door, she saw a young woman standing on the threshold. It seemed like she was chewing gum. Camille said, may I help you? Yes, ma'am. Are you Camille Tronder, wife of Max Tronder? Why, yes I am. 
Why do you ask? Ma'am, you have been served, the woman stated, taking Camille's picture and passing her a folder containing several documents. As the woman made her way back to her car, Camille was repeating, What? What? After entering the house again, Camille sat down at the kitchen table to examine the enigmatic folder. She nearly passed out when she noticed the first document's title, Petition for Divorce. She thought back to Max's parting advice to hire legal counsel. She knew they wouldn't be returning after what she had done. As she sat there and looked at the comfortable kitchen she had shared with Max, the future, Camille was correct. Her adultery did not lead to her and Max returning. Six years later, Camille's thoughts were bogged down in the past as she sat in the opulent hotel ballroom, watching Jane dance with her new husband. She had thought that life had been awful while the girls had been teenagers. Too many extracurricular activities, too much teenage angst because too many boys were either too sweet or, in Camille's opinion, too rude to the girls. Max was too busy and her paralegal profession was too monotonous. Life had been so overwhelming back then, but now she missed it terribly. She continued to perform the same tedious paperwork at the same law business. She desired, looking up at her date, a perfectly charming middle-aged lawyer who was paunchy and balding and was going to accompany her to Janie's wedding and reception. Camille said, Camille said, Camille, here's your wine. Your daughter looks lovely, just like her mother. He was a nice man, and if he was that interested, she could imagine herself being married to him. Thank you, Carl. You're sweet, and thank you for the wine also. He was not, however, Max. She couldn't help but glance at Max from across the room. After returning from a climbing expedition in Nepal, he seemed to Camille like a bronze statue of a Greek god, with a tanned complexion, extremely fit appearance, and even more gorgeous features than she could have imagined. He was currently holding hands with a stunning woman who looked just as fit as Max as they both smiled and laughed. Joan was with her boyfriend at the time. Joan had informed her that Max had traveled, sailed, and climbed with this woman for months after they had met on a previous climbing expedition, possibly in South America. Camille felt nauseated even thinking about it. Carl yelled, Camille, in an attempt to catch her attention. Yes, Carl. Camille, I think we should leave. You've done your duties as mother of the bride, and you're staying here. Drooling over your ex-husband is not doing you any good. And, I dare say, it's not good for whatever relationship you and I are developing, though it was difficult for her. Camille ignored Max and his very attractive girlfriend, and gave her girls hugs and kisses before saying, Carl, you are sweet, and you're absolutely right. Let me go say good. Bye to my daughters, and we're out of here. As Camille was exiting the ballroom, Max noticed her and felt a twinge of nostalgia for their earlier days spent together. Joan was questioning him as he observed her. Sorry, Joni. What were you saying? Daddy, remember that weird-looking gold Mercedes you were driving when you and Jane and I had brunch that morning when you drove over to see us at Duke? Whatever happened to that car? Max turned to his climbing girlfriend again and said, Ah, Joni, that's quite a story, which I will not bore you with. I'll just say I had borrowed that strange gold Mercedes from a friend and eventually gave it back to her. I think she sold it. It was really a bad luck car, 